It is a moment of great spiritual significance in this small church in the formerly communist-run city of Tallinn, Estonia. A church still being resurrected after long years of neglect under Soviet rule. On this day, His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, is here in this city on the Baltic Sea, celebrating a service for the faithful. The Patriarch is one of the most important religious leaders on earth, the spiritual shepherd of more than 250 million Orthodox Christians worldwide. It is a day of renewal for the people of this church. But the purpose of the Patriarch's visit isn't limited solely to religious matters. In recent years, he has chosen a bold new approach to the environment. To the Patriarch, what we've done to the environment is nothing less than sin, true crimes against creation. To fight these crimes, the Patriarch is using the power of his pulpit in a modern day crusade. So much so, the media have affectionately dubbed him the Green Patriarch. In the summer of 2003, the Patriarch Bartholomew traveled the Baltic Sea as host of a symposium called The Sea at Risk, A Common Heritage, A Shared Responsibility. It gives us great satisfaction and joy that the initiative began in the year 1995 to explore the problems of the pollution of the environment has become established as a regular institution and we are now meeting for the fifth time to continue our research. The Patriarch gathered more than 250 people for a voyage across the Baltic. Scientists, religious clerics, economists, journalists and powerful political leaders. And these are people who perhaps don't interact all that often and putting us together on a ship seems quite an effective way of forcing us to interact and uh, forcing us to find a common language. The benefit is about linking the power of science and the power of religious organizations on the side of, on the right side of a struggle. To have religion become partner with nature and partner with people and to have the real roots of religion kept alive for being a savior of humanity and nature rather than a threat to humanity and nature, a source of love and compassion rather than a source of hate and intolerance. Uh, for me, it's, it's like oxygen. I think one of the things that's so important about the symposia is he's just not reaching out to his own uh, religious community, but he's drawing in very senior leaders from a diversity of religious traditions and really creating a forum where they're able not only to speak with scientists and people in the development community and people concerned with uh, human rights and social equity, but they're also able to speak among themselves and to compare and contrast some of the approaches each of the faiths can bring to the environment issue. This tour of the Baltic Sea was the fifth symposium sponsored by the Patriarch. Previous symposia examined the Aegean Sea, the Black Sea, the Danube River, and the Adriatic. During the symposium on the Adriatic, the ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew and Pope John Paul II signed an historic manifesto, a joint declaration of the necessity to protect the environment. The symposia were initially intended to add a religious point of view to the thinking of scientists. But scientists are also influencing the patriarchate. When they began the symposia, Metropolitan John of Pergamon, the most prominent theologian of the Orthodox Christian Church, said the Church envisioned humans as stewards of nature. They've now taken that idea well beyond mere stewardship. Instead, the Church sees human beings as priests of creation. We do not ask people to respect the environment simply for negative reasons, 
such as the fear of destruction, etc. This would be an ecology based on fear. We ask people to take a positive view of ecology, something like an attitude of love towards nature. As priests rather than stewards, we embrace nature instead of managing it. And although this may sound romantic and sentimental, this embracing of nature amounts to our very being, to our existence. The Metropolitan has been listening to scientists clearly brooding about what they've said in the past. And he's now trying to escape from this stewardship idea to a concept which he described as, you know, man is the priest of a natural creation. This is due, in a way, to this, to becoming so familiar with the thinking of some of what you might call the other side, or the scientific side. For those attending the symposium, dealing with the environmental issues of the Baltic Sea was no easy task. It is a landlocked body of water, surrounded by 85 million people in 10 countries, with a centuries-old history of changing borders and politics. You don't have a single spot that has not been heavily contested. That was owned only by one group for a, a considerable time. It always changed ownership with accompanying wars and ethnic conflicts. Political and economic divisions frequently make consensus difficult. Poland, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia have recently freed themselves from the former Soviet Union and joined the European Union. Russia remains separate, but they are all much poorer than their Western neighbors, more interested in developing their economies than solving environmental problems. I know that uh, the Polish government, they uh, do something when there is international pressure. Just by themselves, they are too busy. They're not <laughs> caring about such things like environment. They, they have many questions to, to think about. They, their agenda is, is very uh, saturated with other more urgent, maybe, questions. And environmental protection, I, I believe, is not their priority. Nevertheless, the actions of each country surrounding the Baltic profoundly affect the others. More than 200 rivers bring water into the Baltic, but there is only one outlet to the ocean, a series of narrow straits near Denmark and Sweden that connects the Baltic to the North Sea. Whatever flows in takes 25 years to flow out. This slow exchange of water makes the Baltic basin extremely vulnerable to any kind of pollution. The Baltic Sea in some ways is a microcosm of the problems that face the world's ocean. It is a piece of water surrounded by people and because of that it responds to the pulse of human activity, both the things we take out and the things we put in. For decades most people paid little attention to what was flowing in. Now, they've identified 800 environmental hotspots. There are huge problems. I mean, it, it is not a, a dying or a dead sea, but it is a heavily polluted, probably the most heavily polluted sea in, in, in the world. One major source of pollution comes from fertilizers used in farms surrounding the Baltic. The nutrients wash off the land into the sea and overfeed aquatic plants creating a condition called eutrophication. It is the syndrome that happens when too much in the way of nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, are poured into waters and they encourage the growth of phytoplankton and bacteria plankton in the water column, scummy or fuzzy algae on the bottom and tend to make the water cloudy so that sunlight, which is essential for photosynthesis on the seafloor, does not reach the seafloor any longer. 
The sea must also absorb polluting substances from factory smokestacks and industrial waste waters. Heavy metals like lead, copper, mercury, zinc and cadmium form a toxic sludge on the sea floor that is poisoning marine life. One of them, cadmium, is we, we know that this is decreasing in the seawater, but still we have in several parts in the central and in the northern parts of the Baltic Sea, we see the increase of cadmium concentration in the herring uh, tissue and, and therefore uh, we are concerned about the quality of the food. Birth defects caused by heavy metals and chemical pollution are becoming common. This pike, for example, was exposed to chlorine bleach in its early development and grew a deformed jaw and fins. The number of healthy fish in the Baltic has dropped significantly. Symposium participants put a large part of the blame on the modern fishing industry. There was, a, there was a day, it's not so far, not so long ago, where people talk about that the sea is not possible for man to empty the sea. Everyone talked about it. The sea is so big that it's not possible for us to take away the resources. Today, everyone say we, it was wrong. The fishermen are our allies in, in most of these attempts to, to clean the Baltic Sea, protect the Baltic Sea. But due to industrial fisheries and so forth, we have had unsustainable fisheries that have killed or at least greatly diminished major fisheries, especially codfish, but also threatening herring in the Baltic Sea. You know, they catch up to one million tons of codfish. And then it's going down, going down, going down. And when it reaches around 150,000 tons, and it's never been re restored. Even fishery is stopped, the cod is not coming back. I think the answer is that we're also destroying their habitat. We are destroying the ecosystem in which little cod hide so that they can avoid predators and they can find food. And by doing so, we're losing cod. There's an enormous difference among ways we fish. Some produce very little collateral damage and some, like bottom trawling and uh, drift netting, are extremely problematic. A bottom trawler is a boat that pulls a net along the seafloor, and in doing so, it has three environmental effects. It catches the organisms it's supposed to catch, it catches other organisms of bycatch, and it disturbs the life on the seafloor. Here is a photograph I took showing the organisms that are caught in a trawl net. And what you may notice is that about 95% of the organisms by weight were not shrimp. The shrimpers call this trawl trash. I call it biodiversity. This is an untrawled coral reef off the coast of Norway in deep water. And you can see it is a home for abundant redfish. But after a trawler goes through, the ecosystem looks like this. I think everywhere we trawl, we will see that structure-loving species of fish will disappear. Another threat to the ecosystem comes from oil tankers plying the waters of the Baltic Sea. Our shores are tremendously vulnerable <coughs> to any oil spill disaster. And we know that oil transports are increasing by the day and that the Russians are building a big harbor for oil transport in Primorsk that will be one of the world's leading ports in oil transport. More tankers clearly means more potential for accidents. One oil spill occurred in the Baltic even while members of the symposium were discussing such dangers. Only last week we saw the sinking of the bulk carrier Fushan Hai between Bornholm and the Swedish coast after a collision in good weather and with good visibility. Yesterday afternoon I visited the coast of Scania in southern Sweden where thick black oil is just now invading the shores. And we all now know that this can happen 
every day and we can have much more uh, terrible accidents in the Baltic. Shipping in the Baltic opens the door to another environmental hazard invasive species that destroy the original marine ecosystem. Modern oil transporting tankers can take several hundreds of cubic meters of ballast water in the estuary in one part of the world and within 10 days cross the Atlantic Ocean and release this water in the estuary of the Baltic. Uh, there are a lot of invasive species in the Baltic and we know today and that we have received over 100 species. The round goby, for instance, is a bottom-dwelling fish that has moved aggressively into the Baltic and other European waters, taking over spawning grounds and food sources from native species. What's the difference between the other issues, the other threats, and the invasive species thing is that we can hope at least if the eutrophication, the loadings of uh, nutrients or uh, loadings of toxic substances, fishing practices are changed, we can hope that the whole system will recover in shorter or longer time perspective, which is not the case with the invasive species. When we get those invaders into the system, we will never be able to get rid of them. Though all the countries bordering the Baltic contribute to the environmental problems, the worst offender is Russia. Much damage was done under communism. The devastation is just unbelievable. I mean, probably the environmental wreckage in the Soviet Union is worse than anywhere else in, on Earth. Perhaps even more damage is being done as Russia struggles to rebuild its economy. Because Russia is a very big country with very big problems, other, even other than environment. And so on the table of their leaders, environmental problems are not on top of the list. You see, when you have so much uh, territories to use, you just uh, move to another clean place when you have spoiled one. And that's why the, the mentality is different there. The difference between the attitudes of the West and Russia was highlighted when the members of the symposium visited the Kuronian Spit, a bird sanctuary of untouched natural beauty that straddles the border between Lithuania and Russia. Environmentalists want it preserved. So do the Russians. But they're also interested in a large reservoir of oil there, a deposit of 250 million barrels, oil much in demand in the West. Uh, the distinction between the good guys and the bad guys in the ecological sense is a little bit grey, because um, the Western side of the Baltic have interested customers. We need the energy. Um, the eastern exporters have the energy and what needs to be done is not to put the cog in and say you can't do that, but to find a way of doing it with a reduced risk. In the area of the Baltic Sea, St. Petersburg tops the list of environmental hotspots. It has no water treatment plants. All sewage, agricultural runoff and industrial wastewater flows directly into the Gulf of Finland in the northern part of the Baltic. Last week, and we celebrated the anniversary of St. Petersburg, the Baltic, the Baltic Sea around the St. Petersburg will not live a further 300 years if the Neva stream continues to load current levels of waste to the Gulf of Finland. One part of the solution is already underway. European Union countries have recently given Russia money and expertise to help build a wastewater treatment plant in St. Petersburg. I mean, that's a big project, cleaning water, uh, wastewater treatment, that will do a lot to the Gulf of, of uh, the Finnish Gulf and, and to the Baltic Sea. But there has to be more money put in 
if we should if we uh, could see a, a rapid uh, results. Most environmentalists fear, however, that cash-strapped Russia will continue to spend its efforts on economic development rather than the environment. That's one of the reasons the Patriarch invited Russian scientists to join the symposium. On this journey across the Baltic, they are side by side with the others, searching for solutions. Both Soviet government uh, and present democratic government, uh, they demonstrate their readiness uh, to solve environmental problem. But uh, now uh, we have a general crisis which prevent us to continue uh, our research. As the ship continued its journey through the Baltic Sea, the members of the symposium had a seemingly endless list of environmental problems to tackle. Eutrophication, overfishing, toxic waste, oil spills and air pollution. To that long list, history added another peril. A deadly legacy from World War II. After the war, Britain, France, the United States and Russia disposed of chemical weapons captured from the Germans by dumping them in the Baltic Sea. The Allies had intended to dispose of them in the much larger and much more forgiving Atlantic Ocean. But a violent storm forced a change of plans. 300,000 tons of sarin gas, lewisite, mustard gas and Zyklon B, enough to wipe out all of Europe, now wait beneath the waves of the Baltic. Their canisters are corroding and the chemicals may still be potent enough to kill millions. It's a, a, a abnormal situation. People don't know what should be done. In, in this situation, uh, speculation. 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 So, so the, uh, this situation is uh, not normal and should be normalized. What to do the next is to organize normal monitoring and normal study of this problem. It needs uh, nothing but funding of permanent environmental monitoring. Though the participants in the symposium saw many examples of problems as their ship progressed through the Baltic, they also saw evidence of change for the better. In Tallinn, Estonia, an unsightly landfill is being transformed. Thanks to a new biogas plant, garbage is being turned into methane gas, creating power to light streets and heat homes. In Helsinki, Finland, the Patriarch led a tour of the state-of-the-art sewage treatment complex, an environmentally conscious plant capable of processing wastewater for a million people. It was built underground, the largest such facility in the world, and replaces 11 separate treatment plants, freeing the land for other uses and dramatically improving Helsinki's urban landscape. This facility is the model for the new wastewater treatment plant, now under development in St. Petersburg, Russia. To the members of the symposium, one thing became clear. Change required the active participation of the Earth's political leaders. If you want to change something, you have to convince politicians, decision makers. It's very difficult to do this. You know it yourself. If you don't come along with a price tag on this change. In Sweden, scientists pressured the government to stop using chlorine in the pulp and paper mills. They convinced them that environmentally friendly paper could gain a marketing advantage. The Swedish government put a demand on the industry to change the process, which they did fairly quickly because they saw 
that they can earn money by changing the process and use that in their public relation. That we are not using chlorine for bleaching, so buy our white paper. In seven short days, members of the symposium discussed the issues of the environment in a broad variety of formal panel discussions, group meetings, and one-on-one -on -one conversations. They debated wide-ranging issues like sustainable development, how to attract religions to the environmental movement, how best to protect the environment without further harming the world's poor, and what specifically should be done to repair the devastation of the Baltic Sea. Environmental ethics became a central part of every discussion. Prophet Muhammad says, beware of earth, for she is your mother. No one does good or evil on her without her eventually telling of it. In other words, nothing can be concealed forever. Sooner or later, the people on this earth will appreciate us or curse us for what we have done because our mother earth will either flourish or suffer from our deeds. This symposium seems to bring something new, or rather someone new. God is entering the arena. I, I was um, um, really uh, fascinated by this mix of religion, science and environment. And I think this represents uh, the ultimate approach to the uh, environment uh, issues. We need a closer cooperation between religious values, scientific knowledge and environmental awareness. His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, hopes his symposia inspire a new beginning, a beginning that will build the momentum necessary to achieve his ultimate goal, an earth as clean and pure as in the first days of creation. We believe that with the creation of a new environmental ethos based on humility, self-restraint and sacrifice, we can evolve into priests of creation capable of safeguarding the world that God has entrusted to us. What His Holiness the Patriarch is laying out in terms of what religion is really about, our role in creation, what that is about, is a message that is not just relevant for religion. It's relevant for citizens reclaiming rights they are losing and it's necessary to create another worldview beyond the market, beyond ownership and beyond violence and war. I think it's very necessary that, that the, the work with the environment is resting on these two feet, religion and science, and that it meets in one body, so to say, in one head. And heart, not to least the heart. We are all born priests. And unless we remain so throughout our lives, we are bound to suffer the ecological consequences we are now experiencing. Fittingly, this voyage of mind, heart and spirit would end in the beautiful city of Stockholm, Sweden. The capital of a country that in recent years has dedicated itself to restoring its once pristine environment. As the ship made its way to its final destination, the Patriarch Bartholomew celebrated the success of the journey they had shared in a ceremonial blessing of the sea. There is truly only one ocean with all its parts interconnected just as there is only one spirit which unites us all. If we can find the faith to love each other and to love God, 
then we can find the faith to help his vast water planet live and flourish. We invite all of you to join us in pledging to protect the oceans as an act of devotion, whatever your religion may be. If we love God, we must love his creation.